the Nibelungenlied. Okay, so we started this in class, but we didn't get all the way finished with it. So picking up on page 184, I will start on the first full paragraph that begins there. The proud companions were then summoned to table. There were great many seated in that meadow. Piles of sumptuous dishes were set before the noble huntsmen. But the butlers who were to pour their wine were very slow to appear. In other words, there's no wine. Yet knights could not be better cared for than they, and if only no treachery had been lurking in their minds, those warriors would have been above reproach. So there's definitely a gang out to get Siegfried. Seeing that we are being treated to such a variety of dishes from the kitchen, said Lord Siegfried, I fail to understand why the butlers bring us no wine unless we hunters are better looked after. I'll not be a companion of the hunt. I thought I had deserved better attention. So Siegfried's not happy, but he says it very politely. What can I say? We shall be very glad to make amends for you. Sorry. We shall be very glad to make amends to you for our present lack, answered the perfidious king from the table. Check your footnote. Perfidious means treacherous. So this is actually referring to Gunther. He's the king of Burgundy and he has evil intentions towards Siegfried. This is Hagen's fault. He wants us to die of thirst. My very dear Lord, replied Hagen of Tronach, I thought the day's hunting would be away in the Spessart, and so I sent the wine there. If we go without drink today, I shall take good care that it does not happen again. Okay, so the wine got sent to the wrong place. They were supposed to be stopping someplace else to hunt. Probably part of Hagen's hunt. He has really planned this out. So he's going to have Siegfried, Siegfried get thirsty. And then he knows of a spring nearby. So he's going to challenge Siegfried to race him to the spring. And then he's going to get him all alone and kill him in his vulnerable spot. Those fellows, said Lord Siegfried, it was arranged that they were to bring along seven panniers of spiced wine and mead for me. Since that proved impossible, we should have been placed nearer the Rhine. Okay, so he's just talking about where they should have stopped. You brave and noble knights, said Hagen of Tronach, I know a cool spring nearby. Do not be offended. Let us go there. A proposal which, as it turned out, was to bring many knights into jeopardy. Siegfried was tormented by thirst and ordered the board to be removed all the sooner in his eagerness to go to that spring at the foot of the hills. And now the knights put their treacherous plot into execution. Word was given for the game which Siegfried had killed to be conveyed back to worms on wagons. And for all who saw it, gave him great credit for it. Hey, worms, uh, that's a significant city in the life of Martin Luther. Hmm, that might be a good bonus question for a quiz. Anyway, Hagen of Tronic broke his faith with Siegfried most grievously. Broke his faith is just a fancy way of saying he was unkind. For as they were leaving to go to the spreading lime tree, he said, I have often been told that no one can keep up with Lady Krimhild's lord when he cares to show his speed. I wish he could show it us now. He's saying it so deceitfully. You can easily put it to the test by racing me to the brook, replied gallant Siegfried of the Netherlands. Then those who see it shall declare the winner. I accept your challenge, said Hagen. Then I will lie down in the grass at your feet as a handicap, replied brave Siegfried, much to Gunther's satisfaction. And I will tell you what more I shall do. I will carry all my equipment with me, my spear and my shield and all my hunting clothes. 
and he quickly trapped on his quiver and sword. The two men took off their outer clothing and stood there in their white vests. Then they ran through the clover like a pair of wild panthers. Nice simile, huh? Siegfried appeared first at the brook, of course. Gunther's magnificent guest. That's a reference to Siegfried who excelled so many men in all things, quickly unstrapped his sword, took off his quiver, and after leaning his great spear against a branch of the lime, stood beside the rushing brook. Then he laid down his shield near the flowing water, and although he was very thirsty, he most courteously refrained from drinking until the king had drunk. Wow, I told you he was a gentleman. Gunther thanked him very ill for this. In other words... He let Gunther drink first, and drink Gunther repaid him by killing him. The stream was cool, sweet, and clear. Gunther stooped to its running waters, and after drinking, stood up and stepped aside. Siegfried, in turn, would have liked to do the same, but he paid for his good manners. For now, Hagen carried Siegfried's sword and bow beyond his reach. This guy is sneaky ran back for the spear and searched for the sign on the brave man's tunic. Then, as Siegfried bent over the brook and drank, Hagen hurled the spear at the cross so that the hero's heart's blood leapt from the wound and splashed against Hagen's clothes. No warrior will ever do a darker deed, leaving the spear fixed in Siegfried's heart, he fled in wild desperation as he had never fled before from any man. When Lord Siegfried felt the great wound, maddened with rage, he doesn't die, of course not. He bounded back from the stream with the long shaft jutting from his heart. He was hoping to find either his bow or his sword, and had he succeeded in doing so, Hagen would have had his pay. He would have gotten revenge, in other words. But Finding no sword, the gravely wounded man had nothing but his shield. Snatching this from the bank, he ran at Hagen, and King Gunther's vassal was unable to elude him. Siegfried was wounded to death, yet he struck so powerfully that he sent many precious stones whirling from the shield as it smashed to pieces. Okay, so basically, this is like the first Captain America. He uses his shield as a weapon because he has nothing else, and he hits Hagen so hard with it that the jewels that were on it bounce off. Gunther's noble guest would dearly have loved to avenge himself. Hagen fell reeling under the weight of the blow, and the riverside echoed loudly. Had Siegfried had his sword in his hand, it would have been the end of Hagen. So enraged was the wounded man, as indeed he had good cause to be. Okay, quick little commercial break. You remember that uh, Siegfried's sword was called Balmon, and it was an excellent weapon. So I know I mentioned in one class, I have a sword, and you can see Colada del Cid. So this is the sword of El Cid, who is the Spanish hero comparable to Siegfried and Beowulf, and all those guys. So this was back in times when uh, you could bring all kinds of things on airplanes still. And so I had this packed in my suitcase, not my carry-on, of course. So back to the story. If only Siegfried had had his sword. The hero's face had lost its color and he was no longer able to stand. His strength had ebbed away for in the field of his bright countenance, he now displayed death's token. So basically he's turning pale because of blood loss and he's going to die. Soon, many fair ladies would be weeping for him. The Lady Kriemhild's Lord fell among the flowers where you could see the blood surging from his wound. This is the typical thing in a courtly romance. You have to appeal to the ladies too. So here he is. He's a handsome guy and he's lying in the flowers and bleeding to death. 